yourself a moment to let your hands become still. And if you want, you can close your eyes. If you would prefer to just cast your gaze down or look um, away from the screen for a moment, give your eyes a break. And just take a few deep breaths. And when you take your deep breaths, notice if your shoulders are rising and falling. And if your shoulders are moving with your breath, see if you can pull that breath down a little lower and let it move into the fullness of your lungs. When we are living in stress, we tend to breathe up high in our chest. So this is just a moment to breathe down a little bit lower to expand the capacity of your lung. And see if you can slow your breath down, not to a point of feeling anxiety, but just enough to really let your nervous system know that it's time to relax. And just take a moment to start to create a list of all of the things that you are grateful for right here and right now. It could be gratitude for this group, but also for the air you're breathing, for food and water. But most importantly, take a moment to be grateful for you and all that you do each day. For all that you're able to offer to others and to each other. But most importantly, for what you can offer to yourself even if it is just a few moments of deep breathing. So just take a few more deep breaths here. Recalibrating your nervous system, toning it up, strengthening it. And the next time you take a deep breath in, just try to hold that breath in for just a few moments. Feel what it's like not to exhale. And then sigh that breath out. Maybe your stress melts out of your shoulders. And sometimes it feels good to do that a couple of times. When you're ready, just lift your gaze back onto the screen or open your eyes. No rush to do so. And truly, from the bottom of my heart to all of you, as one former educator, and educator in a different sort of way, uh, to all of you who are actively going through all of the, the year that is this year. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you, Liz. And I have gratitude for you. We really appreciated our partnership with you, Liz. And I think that in education, we can't look at wellness as something nice to have. It is essential. So thank you. Thank you. So why don't we, okay, we'll move on with our agenda. And I believe next up is my friend, Amy Eagle and colleague. We're going to talk about her newsletter, The Roundup. So if Holly, you wouldn't mind pulling up the slide for her. And I'll have Amy take it away. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to thank um, everyone for being here this evening and to um, add my um, expression of gratitude to what Liz had to say, um, we appreciate all of you so much and everything you're doing for our communities. And one way that we want to show that um, is with the, the Roundup. This is a 
new program that Homewood Science Center and the Chicago Southland STEM Network started this year as a way to share STEM news and celebrate STEM achievement locally and globally. So um, many of you are probably already on our mailing list, but um, if you're not and you'd like to um, be included in the weekly roundup, you can go to our webpage, um, click on home up at the top of the screen, scroll down and you'll see um, a button that says um, join our email list, enter your information. And then every week, <laughs> I will show up in your inbox. Um, I will come bearing five quick links to interesting things that are happening in the STEM world. Um, we try to cover a lot of bases here. We've got activities for children and families and adults, uh, scholarship opportunities for um, youth. We've got um, professional development for educators, um, standard-based lessons plans and classroom activities, um, uh, just a range of things. But the point is there's five. So basically, if there is a STEM or STEM education newsletter out there, I'm on it. I have signed up for it. So I am monitoring all of these so you don't have to. Um, everything from you know, NASA, National Geographic, Erickson Institute, um, area colleges and universities, the Chicago Cultural Institutions, local schools and nonprofits, you name it, I'm on their mailing list. And I'm distilling that down to five quick links for you to check out um, every Friday. And then we also take um, a little room each week to just celebrate, um, you know, programs and students um, in our area or, or you know, nationally, globally. Um, Hal, if you want to go on to the next, yeah, there they are. So you can see um, this is a recent issue. Um, there's a local student um, in Cherville who is one of the first black female um, scouts in the nation to earn an Eagle Scout badge. So um, congratulations to her. We really want to celebrate that kind of achievement. If you have students, who are doing something really cool that um, deserves celebration, please let me know. Um, let me know about your programs as well. If you've got a newsletter that I should have on my list, um, send me a link, I will register and I will keep on top of what's going on with your organization and I will share it um, with the rest of the class. Um, so if there are things that you'd be interested in seeing, um, please, we really want this to be a conversation um, within the network um, to let everyone know what's going on um, in our world. And with that, I'll throw it back to Holly and uh, she can let you know a few things that are going on in the Homewood Science Center world. Sure. Thanks, Amy. Um, let me make sure I'm not muted here. Okay, everybody can hear me Holly. okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. It's hard to run the slides and see what's going on in the room, too. Um, I know we have some middle school teachers out there with us today. Um, we love your help in, re in recruiting students for our spring middle school conservation ecology internship. This is a six-week internship starting May 1st. It will run every Saturday. Um, students will be working at Homewood Isaac Walton Preserve. Um, this time around on the Oak Savanna. So please help us get that information out to your students. Um, and then we also have a really unique webinar series that we love, Citizen Science All About Birds. Join us monthly. Um, the next one is April 8th. This will be featuring um, Professor Robin Watley from Columbia College, Chicago. She's a paleontologist. She has experience with digs all over the world, um, bring students out to Arizona to still do digs, and she is going to give a talk on birds are avian dinosaurs. What we've seen with this program is very unique because we offer an extra credit code. So if you're an educator or if you work for a district, please share this with your fellow educators, with your students. Um, if you plan on using our extra credit code, it's super easy. 
at the end of the program, we give, you know, just a basic code and then your students can give you that code as proof of their participation. So if they say, hey, I went into that bird webinar, you just say, what's the extra credit code? And boom, you can award whatever kind of extra credit incentive you'd like. Um, this program is awesome because it gets students to experience science and take part in, in science outside of the classroom and to connect with people that are doing this amazing work, hear about their career pathways, hear about programs that they were involved in. Um, and so we're really gaining a lot of traction with this. So we hope that um, you will join us online April 8th. Um, we have summer camps coming up soon. So be on the lookout. We'll send out some flyers for that. You'll see our spring um, flyer on the agenda. There's a PDF, so please, um, if you can get those out in your digital backpacks or within your organizations, please feel free to share the PDF of, of our spring. And then we're open every Saturday at our pop-up science shop location. Be sure to stop in. Um, you can always pick up um, hands-on STEM pop-up science at home activity kits. Um, and there's some low-tech makerspace stuff going on. So drop in and check out our new location. Um, we do have one partner announcement. I hope the sound goes through on this. I was having some technical difficulties and he had to change out my headphones. So I'm going to go um, less of a full screen and see if you're getting sound on this video. And if somebody can just tell me if you're hearing the sound on this. And then if not, I'll show you this video at the end. Okay. Are you guys catching that sound? Okay, great. Hey, guys. This is Libby Jean, and are you ready for the future of STEAM and big talk business? You must be 14 to 19 to enter at any level of STEAM knowledge or involvement. Register on my website, joinbeginning.com today. I'm talking science, technology, engineering, art, and math, business based competitions. Over $15,000 in cash, scholarships, prizes, and professional services. You are under 18. Make sure you have a guardian to sign up. Bring your A game, fix your stock. The North Korean speaker of STEAM is competition. Sign up today. Registration is finished March 19th. Let's go! So, um, Dorothy Genius, I don't know if they're on the call right now, um, but she has a, a STEAM camp. Um, and if your students are interested in applying for that, I can get the link out to you in the chat as well. I wanted to open up to see if anybody did have any quick announcements, wanted to share a program. You can do that either in our chat or if you want to unmute now, we can pause if anybody wanted to share out a special event or something um, with our group that we should know about. We'd love to hear what else is going on. And then if not, that we will, will go over pass to it over to me. If you think of something, you can always still put it in the chat, you know, if you want to add it. And we'll be we'll be checking the chat and we can add that, right, Holly? Um, yeah, so we can we can also pause at the end of um, our convening today too if anybody wanted to do a quick shout out or share. And just know too, if you have any information about events or programs that you would like help in marketing and putting out there, please email um, Edie, me, or Amy. Amy can get it in the roundup. We can get it on our social media. Um, yep. We are more than happy to, to um, boost all of our partners' events and be there for you guys online and, and help get people towards your programming too. So with that being I, said, um, so Amanda. Yeah, we have Amanda. Yeah, we. And we've got we found this little video, so we'll we'll after the video, Amanda, if you want to take over. Um, thanks for joining us. Focus on really engaging students when it was a crucial time point where in fourth grade, I want to learn our own, and it really changes the direction of their lives. But at the fourth grade age, um, around that time frame, their ability to abstract concepts are not as in depth. So we can make it seem like these are in real life, you know, a new dimension of where we're playing. We can bring whatever we want into the play space. What we're really able 
gaming for is for you for kids to not just learn circuits, but to learn more of the underlying thought process of what the system, how the system, how our inputs and interactions with that system leading to the output or the objective. There's a lot of these 21st century skills around um, the collaborative elements, self-efficacy, and also like persistence and things like that that we're trying to build up. You'll now know how to critically think within a system or analyze the system and understand how to change the elements of the system to get the outcome that you want. Whether you live in a more affluent neighborhood or an urban school district, you have the same access to get that excitement about learning from science and STEM. And we can do that because we can provide a science kit to any student, basically, and make it fun and engaging and gamify it. Welcome, Amanda. We're so glad you're here. Amanda, you're on mute. <laughs> there you go. All we, right. have known, we have known Amanda for, I'd say, two or three years now, Amanda. Yeah, I yeah. Know. we had a mutual friend, and um, it, it culminated this summer when you offered a camp, which was right. amazing, a camp using um, the Mind Labs app. And explore interactive. So Amanda is uh, coming to us from Lafayette, from Purdue, and uh, she has created something really cool. I'm excited for her to share it with you. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, thank you. Um, that video was put together by Purdue after we got one of our SBIR grants, which is a small business grant for innovative research. So our company has gotten one from both the NSF and the NIH. And that's contributed to the work that we've done here. And I'll be mostly talking about augmented reality. So I was glad to hear that there are some fans there. And like John, I do also a lot of times get in character when I'm, you know, doing presentations and clip in my, it's there on the, it's really there on this side, but uh, I clip in one that makes it a lot more obvious. So <laughs> um, what I wanted to do is just do a quick intro to augmented reality. Talk about how I think AR integrates with engineering design. Um, show off sort of what we're proud of, which is our collaboration and engagement, and then talk about also how we're working on um, incorporating literacy and writing into what we're doing with AR. And then lastly, I'll point you to a resource if you if you want or get, if I sell you very well on AR, where you can find a million different AR things to look into uh, to, to investigate further. So just on a very basic level, a lot of people have a little bit of confusion between AR and VR. So AR would be things that are existing in the world or the space that you see around you, um, whereas VR is shutting off everything and everything you're seeing is in that virtual world. So a couple of examples here we have, you know, looking at a, a card, like this is what we're showing in the video, looking at a card and seeing something appear over that card um, or in a, in a larger scale, seeing things all around you, like in this space here. There are really big differences in what you need in, in terms of devices to execute that. So AR really can be just the handheld devices that you might already have in your classroom or maybe have in their pockets. I also think there's big differences in how the kids, uh, students are able to interact with each other and communicate with each other while they're engaging in the activity. So there are some pretty big differences uh, between the two. When it comes to our preference, which is AR, um, I wanted to pull up this quote from Tim Cook that really, I think, brings it home. He says that AR is like the smartphone. Now, if you can imagine, like I can, the world before your smartphone, okay? And how I couldn't imagine why I wanted pictures on my phone, right? Like that was, <laughs> and then the world now, right? And that's kind of, uh, that's the type of shift between no phone and phone that Tim Cook expects with AR. So it is a big deal and there's gonna be so many cool things that happen around it. I just pulled together some of them. I know a lot of times we're thinking about readiness and, and getting kids ready for what they're gonna see in the future. And these are the places, these are some examples of places that AR is either projected to be or is already kind of there. And so I like the bottom left where it's, I don't think it's quite there yet, but in terms of like a Zoom call where you feel like really with people, where you see their full body, right? And you're kind of sitting at a table. So communication features, design, whether it's more engineering or artistic design, even testing, right? All of these things have places where AR can really bring a lot of benefits in terms of um, expense of the 
experience as well as uh, just being able to zoom in, zoom out, um, you know, interact in, in many different ways. So it's not just a learning tool, it's also the tool of the future, right, in the workforce. Um, oh, and this picture here, so they're showing this one down here, I had him looking at it through a phone, so an AR style phone, but moving towards in the longer run, you'll see even these AR ones are showing them with glasses, though the glasses are more, you know, see-through types of glasses. Um, and then, you know, in terms of interactive information, I think that's one of the places that uh, we're seeing it earlier. So we can see, you know, uh, people viewing an exhibit through a tablet here or having, if they're wearing some sort of Google Glass uh, or one of those glasses type, seeing uh, it helping you navigate the streets or even in museums looking at different, populating the skeleton with this, the outer skin of the, of the, the beast there and just providing additional uh, interactive elements to the learning experience. So the research is there too. Um, there's a lot of research around how augmented reality experiences can improve things like critical thinking, persistence, learning outcomes, retention, and motivation. And all of those things are uh, really beneficial. And especially, I think we're, we're focused in on the younger age group. So bringing those types of experiences in the younger age group and what's not in there is also it's just a bit easier to get there than maybe some of the um, uh, other experiences. So whereas um, some really involved hands on experiences could take a lot of setup and cleanup time for an elementary age teacher that doesn't have classroom space dedicated to that type of activity could have stem a lot more frequently and still feel like hands on when it's in an AR environment that's designed well, obviously. Um, this summer, what Edie was talking about was we integrated the uh, augmented reality work that we did with uh, the Boston Museum of Science and Engineering as Elementary. And really, uh, they were really in favor of how the tools could, could enhance the engineering design process. And I'm gonna talk about a couple places where using augmented reality can really extend and improve the engineering design process that you're probably all very uh, familiar with. Um, so as you know, to get these types of pro projects and experiences into the classroom, a lot of times they have to check more than one box, right? They have to check lots of boxes for teachers to be able to spend the time in the classroom on it. And one of the places where uh, I personally believe that they, they fit in really well is addressing these SEL, um, some of these SEL boxes, right? So solution, self-efficacy, growth mindset, all of these things really can come into play in an engineering design type of project. So I wanted to just show you a couple of ways in augmented reality that that could look. Um, so here is an example of just a very simple design project, right? So here, make a circuit that lights up more than one light, and how would you do it? So this card is what's in the physical space, and these 3D pieces are what's in, in the virtual space for the child. And their objective is to figure out how to draw wires on their screen with their fingers to connect the, the circuit in a way that will make the, the circuit light up, okay? And so they can do it actually more than one way. They could do it in series, like is here, or they could draw in parallel, like is shown up at the top. It's really interesting, I think, about the way that this is showing up in augmented reality is it really shows you what parallel means probably better than a lot of, of, of visualizations of the circuits, right? You can really see that these really are sort of parallel connections, whereas this is what it would look like in um, the physical space, and this is what the Boston Museum of Science physical components did. So you can use augmented reality in the classroom where you don't have the ability to do physical builds or as an accompaniment to physical builds or a design part of the process before you go to physical builds. So understand helping kids work through conceptual ideas before they go to the physical materials so that when they get to the physical materials, maybe there's less, there's less issues with some of the basics and they can go a little bit further with their physical projects or vice versa, they can do a physical project and come back into the virtual space and build something bigger and more elaborate than they'd be able to build in the physical space. So it kind of can go, it can serve on both ends if it's um, integrated with more physical projects. 
Um, another you know, subset of the SEL considerations, communication, teamwork, collaboration, leadership, resolving con conflict, all of those things come into play when you're doing group design projects. And I think probably you'd all say that mostly this type of work is done in groups, agreed? Yeah, it's one of those places where we can really hit on these. And that's where I think a lot of digital tools so far kind of fall down on in terms of allowing for this collaboration. And, and that's one of the things that we actually can do pretty well. So I wanted to just show you a quick example of how that might look. Um, so we use we use these animations. So uh, these car the cards that that we use with our instance of augmented reality um, have this set of what we call idea cards. So this one that you're looking at is like this, right? And the kids view it under the app, and it it triggers that animation that you see there. Um, and to get to that animation, I literally cut open a switch with my dad and looked at it. Right? This is how we kind of worked on building this. Uh, this card. And the idea is as well that even if the children are offline and they have access to these materials, they're still envisioning, you know, that little animation going through their head when they're working with these ideas and building how these ideas work. Um, so this particular example would be after you've talked about open and closed circuits and then you're demonstrating how a switch functions to open and close said circuit, right? And Switches give a lot of opportunity for fun design projects that achieve specific goals. So one of the design projects that we've implemented into our set of curriculum um, is a design project around building an alarm system where you have different watches and they're all trying to set off one alarm. And so I wanted to show you an example and I hope the video goes the same. I didn't see an option of like sharing my screen volume, but um, we'll hope it works pretty well. So the way we set up the design process in, in the materials that we provide is you have criteria and constraints, you have uh, available materials, and um, then you try to build uh, this particular uh, a solution for this. So I'm going to play here because I think that the idea of collaborative AR can be a little bit confusing. So I'm going to play this a little bit so you can see it in action and maybe narrate it a bit as well, although you'll hear, you'll hear me narrating as we go here. So. <laughs> Okay, there's the battery. Pixie, can you add a light bulb? Okay, so I'm going to pause it here for a second. So the, the child across the table has their own card that they are looking at. She's looking at her, her own card here, right? But they'll both see the same thing going on in their space. So both the children see a battery right in front of their particular card. Yeah. She's going to add this light bulb piece in, and as soon as she adds it in, then her partner would also oh, see this wire. Pat, Do you see her drawing the wire? Oh, you're drawing the wire. So they can see each other's oh, actions. Wire. Okay, now kids, can you work together to put a switch in there for the light? Why don't you both put a switch in and see how to make it work for each of you. Look at my How are you going to wire it in there, Pat? So you can also see how he's moving the, the, the wires with his fingers to turn mm -hmm. it on. Let's see if that works. Well, that way it has to have both switches on. So the challenge is to make the switch, each switch, turn the light on, right? Versus having them to both. Uh, trigger the light. Figure out how to wire it where you only need one switch. Yeah. Or I mean, only one switch needs to flip. And so this is, you know, they're they're having to sort of. How would you wire it? So both only one consider how they work. Now this wasn't set up in a classroom environment. In all fairness, these are my two kids working on this, but um, so they didn't go through the whole engineering design process and and fill out their their notebook or any of that around it. But they um, are. How would you wire that switch so that? It, Still both trying to solve this this problem. Max is putting one in for you too. Oops. Oh my God. So one game, two different places. They can be remote as well. But either way, they can be remote or in the same space. They have their own set of cards, so they're not sharing manipulatives. Um, and they are seeing the projects come to life together. 
So that's that's how our um, collaborative functionality works. Oops. Um, so building on that, another element that, that we try to hit on with the AR that we're working on is around the critical thinking, cause and effect, and, and reasoned decision making. So one of the things that we believe is that once kids understand the principles, they make they make good choices when they find a problem. So another element that we really hit on is troubleshooting. And this is one thing that I think is really, really hard to do in the classroom because you're setting up all, you can't go a bunch and set up, you know, six different instances of something that's broken and then have the kids all have a chance to try to fix it. I did it once for my kids and it took me like 30 minutes to get one of them set up for one set of kids to look at, right? It's just very difficult. So the idea is that within um, an AR environment, you can set up a bunch of, of, of practice troubleshooting instances where the kids can go through and find the problem with the circuit and repair it themselves. And that gives them a little bit more of the repetition that can build the understanding of the concepts that's really hard to replicate in the physical space, right? It's just very hard to, to replicate. So for example, here'd be a show, uh, the same like two sets of parallel and series circuits but there's something wrong here, right? And so do you all see what's wrong with this circuit on the left? Why it wouldn't light up? So this one's lighting up, this one's not. Anyone? So the problem is that there's a wire here between these two legs of the LED. So there's a short circuit all the way around here. It's skipped, the energy does not even go into the LEDs because it's skipping the, the going up to the LED. So there's this extra wire in between these legs. You notice it's not here that once you strip that extra wire out and those are the things that they look for when you build with especially like squishy circuits. This happens a lot because they take their LED and stick it into one ball. Right. And that means there's a path for that electricity right past the LED. So when they work on these things before they hit the Play-Doh, then you can talk about how the, the Play-Doh does one thing and the clay does another and Kind of have a lot of awareness around those ideas so we want to move that Amanda, wire. Uh -huh. we do we have do a question, question coming in the, the chat, chat. Um, um, are these are programs, these programs compatible, compatible with chromebook so the way that the um the cards are read and the way typical chromebooks work with forward facing cam uh, cameras facing the user instead of away from the user um, as well as not being touch screen the uh the app is only on uh, handheld devices, not on Chromebooks. So um, Chromebooks are evolving a little bit towards that way, right? Being touchscreen, being having forward facing cameras. And we hope that when that's more prevalent, that that will be available. But any phone, pretty much any phone that's around and most iPads are have enough tech because we actually use an AR that's lower tech to get the image recognition. So most uh, tablets. Um, the last piece, I know I'm, I'm at 640 and I cut out half my slides, so, and you guys gave me five extra minutes, so with all that, um, the last piece that we're working on actually going into the future is building some scaffolding into that uh, collaborative space to try to bring in this, the engineering and design notebook right in line with the design experience. Now we're writing grants to do that right now, so I'd love to hear um, how important that would be to you. Uh, but what we envision is um, we have a lot of, of our of our curriculum is in a PDF form that you can write on and draw on. But we kind of like to have that more integrated with the design process to to guide kids through it a little bit. But there's a lot of opportunities, as you probably well know, in in these design projects to do writing around either the troubleshooting process. Right. So there's a lot of pieces in the troubleshooting or in testing and building your design does it meet your requirements what else do i need to do how could i fix it right to work on those so those are just kind of some examples and then the reflection piece which is so important as well so all of these things are things we want to integrate sort of alongside the design process within the app to get a, a portfolio kind of feel as well as have these processes and reflections documented um, this was one of the students that Edie brought us uh, in terms of that worked on this in the camp. She sent me this this screenshot to tell me how much fun she had working on her uh, her design experience. So I really love that she obviously put in 
She put in a buzzer and a fan, and these are all pieces that are, are in the set as well, the light bulb, different batteries, and the switch. And she, had a, she was an awesome student and had a really good time. Um, in terms of self-efficacy, we didn't have huge data points because we had to collect both the beginning and the end, but everybody moved more towards having some um, uh, efficacy. Not, I want to be an engineer necessarily, but if I did, if I wanted to, I could. So an improvement towards, I have the capacity to be that kind of a, a person. So I did promise other AR tools. So I was giving you a highlight of um, what we believe is important and what we're working on in our app, but there's a whole subset. So I wanted to share this particular um, sort of influencer. So her name's Jamie Donnelly, and she has a uh, blog called ARVR and EDU. And I actually just got her brand new, this is brand new, like hot off the presses today, this immersive classroom book. So it has a lot of different AR opportunities and it's very applied. She's a, a teacher, a former teacher herself. And she also right now in March does a, um, every day she sort of covers a new AR app and that's in process right now. So you can go and sort of follow her and she is just outstanding. Does a lot of speaking at conferences as well. So here's what's in our app, a bunch of different um, activities around these topics, some, uh, some creative design projects that are more open-ended and I'm only two minutes over. So you all are ready and you've earned your AR engineering badge. And thanks for having me today. Well, Amanda, it was awesome to have you. And I just put in the chat too, we have your Mind Labs kits available at our shop. And anyone on this call who would like to try them out, I will be happy to give you one. So um, our, our pop-up science shop is open uh, Saturdays from 10 to 1. All you, all you need to do once you get the kits of cards like Amanda showed you was to, you need a tablet and then you need to download the Mind Lab app. But all these, yeah. yeah. All the instructions are there. So it's a really fun thing to to play around with. And Amanda, we're gonna keep tabs with you and everything how this is developing because it seems like it's just going gonna go this is the direction for STEM education to make it, right? And I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on especially specifically this sort of engineering design journaling idea that we're putting into our next grant and sort of how important that is. I really don't think there's anything out there that does a great job at that at all, Abs even without AR. But anyways, that's that's what we're, we're building for it. So thank that's you again. And I don't want to steal awesome. more of Sarah's time. So <laughs> we're happy to happy to introduce you to everyone. Um, if you are directly interested in this, please email me. I see there's a comment from Laura, Lara. Uh, Bates, so just let me know and um, I'll be happy to connect you or um, get the kits to you, okay? So next up, Holly, thanks again, Amanda. We really appreciate you joining us. And we loved your camp. All the kids loved it. It was great. I loved it. I sat in a lot of it and I was like, I wish I had this exposure. But Holly, let's talk about, let's do our mentee meter. So, you know, today and every day when we think about our network, we want to make sure that we're always trying to help our partners to um, strengthen their strengths, identify their strengths, identify areas to work on, um, and really um, recognize your strengths. So, in our agenda, or you can get the link from the chat, we thought about what are some program areas, what are some organizational um, things that we might all have in common, whether you're a school or you're a nonprofit or you're an after school center, whatever it might be, even thinking about your business organization. Um, and we want to want you to rank these. You don't have to rank them all one through seven, uh, but the categories are in person programs, online programs, recruiting, curriculum development funding sources, parent involvement, COVID-19 safety policies and procedures. The thought behind this is if we know that there's partners out there that are really thriving in one area versus the others, maybe we can connect you with um, partners that might need a little bit of that help. So you can um, use that link to vote. Right now, it shouldn't take too, too long. I can um, show what everybody is um, voting on so far. And I thought this would just be a great way to open up conversation. 
and celebrate our strengths and give you some time to recognize as an organization on what you might want to work on. And with our girls club, we're always talking about smart goals. So maybe your organization has a smart goal based on some of your um, strengths and your areas to build on. Well, and I think the other thing that's really good about seeing this is showing the diversity of strengths because the whole point of a partnership, like Amanda has created this great tool and she's like doing all this great research, but she needs students and you have students that are really interested in this type of programming. So like putting the two together makes sense. Um, we need to make those connections. You know, at Home and Science Center, we created these pop-up science at home kits because we saw that there was a need for hands-on learning kits. And schools are doing great work in the classroom, but they need hands-on kits. They need resources. So we work together on that. So I just think there's a lot of work to do in this sector of education, this part of education, and we can do it if we work together and share each other's strengths. It looks like we have some strong um, first and second contenders here in person programs, online programs, uh, we know you guys are offering great um, programs to students, to families. I think one area we can see that we all could use a little help with are funding sources, recruiting, parent involvement. You know, how do we make sure that we're keeping parents connected to our missions, to our programs? Um, so, you know, it's interesting today, we definitely got a great dose of curriculum from Amanda. So thank you for that. And our next speaker as well, um, has wonderful curriculum as well. Um, we'll move right along and introduce our very good friends and colleagues from Project Exploration. We have Sarah and Lynn. And so I am going to, um, Stop sharing my screen so that way they can share away. Um, we'll check in with the Mentimeter uh, before we go just to see everybody's final thoughts. So you can keep working on that. But thank you so much, Sarah and Lynn, for joining us today. And I actually don't, Sarah and Lynn don't have yeah. slides, but that's okay. Let's just no. talk. We're just <laughs> we chatting. Can, we're just here to chat and have a good time. Yeah. And let me just again explain the background. Um, I first met Natasha, um, who Ms. Natasha um, runs the, the project exploration, probably right when we started with Homewood Science Center. And she was gracious enough to come down to Homewood Science Center and talk to us and connect us to what was happening in Chicago. Uh, project exploration, how long has project exploration been going on, Sarah? 20, 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. So we got to, yeah. 20 years. Um, so. Obviously, Lynn and myself have not been working at P that long, but um, Natasha was able to kind of bring that um, up to speed and really make it happen. So we're, we're grateful that she's the executive director over there. But what I want to do, I think it would be great if Lynn shared a bit about the STEM Pathways Cooperative. Um, I know that you are involved in that. We are also very much involved in that. And so I think that would be great. And Holly, I think we're getting some feedback from your mic. A little bit. Your earbuds, I think. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank great. you. Yeah, thanks, sir. So it's really exciting to just hear all the things that everyone has been talking about and really connect the dots because that's all the stuff that the co-op is working on. Um, it's really guided by the principles of, you know, STEM learning as a continuum. Kids deserve access to both in school and out of school and also in home, out of home opportunities for to really develop that STEM identity. And then also it's an ecosystem where parents need to be supported, educators need to be supported, policymakers, everyone. There are so many stakeholders within the STEM learning ecosystem that all needs to collaborate and share knowledge and work together to really strengthen the STEM learning ecosystem. So Project Exploration with its 20 years of being a program provider and working with kids in the STEM field uh, is really the incubator. It's where all of the ideas get tested, all the best practices, all the things that we really think work and 
try are tried and true and develop over time. Those are the things that we then bring over into the co-op and want to share with everyone and bring and highlight best practices, highlight research, highlight things that um, could really help other educators, other providers, but also make connections between different partners, people who maybe have like that poll that we were all doing, people who have really strong connections with recruiting, connecting those people with people who have really awesome programming or connecting fundings and sponsors and really just bringing everyone to the table and working together. So that's the gist of the co-op work and that's what I'm really exciting to be talking about it today. And because of the co-op, that's where we came up with the idea for the Chicago Southland STEM network, which we are, our meeting today. Um, I would say that Chicago is obviously a lot larger. <laughs> There's a lot larger players because you have a lot of institutions in the city, um, like, you know, the museums and, um, you know, higher level funders. But the co-op has been so gracious in allowing Homewood Science Center to sit on, sit in on those meetings and also learn from you. So we want to thank you um, for allowing that to happen because it's really benefited the South suburbs. Just yeah, to and that's, this model. that's absolutely one of the big driving things that drives the co-op being that we know that Chicago is really rich with resources and programs. We know that there's a lot of opportunities out there, but access to it is, eh, here we go. Look at that. That's the access <laughs> part. Perfect timing. Yeah. Access to it is not equal. It's not every kid has access to the same opportunities. It's hard to get access to really quality programming. So yeah, really joining forces and getting people to what they need. So thank you for explaining that, Lynn. And Sarah, can you explain what does Project Exploration do? Yes, I can. Um, and so PE, what we're doing is we are working with students on the South and West sides predominantly. Our goal is for students who are traditionally underrepresented in STEM, students of color, girls, getting them involved in STEM programming, building their confidence, building up their STEM identities. And I like to say that our programming is hands-on, minds-on, right? I think oftentimes what can happen in out-of-school time programming, and you know, Holly and Edie, we talk about this in ACT Now, right? One of the things that can happen is that sometimes there's a lot of focus on the activity and it becomes an activity time or craft hour, and that's great. I think there's time and place for that, but what um what i really push and what i think is great about project exploration is that we're having high expectations we're pushing that rigor to make sure it's a minds-on opportunity for students as well um i have some links that i'm going to put in the chat um just opportunities that we have and opportunities that we've developed and so i know that kind of the theme of this is about hands-on learning, STEM kits, and things of that nature. So when we had to deal with Corona, right, a year to the date, this is the first day that schools were closed, holy smokes, um, we realized that we needed to pivot. All of our programming was in person. Either kids came to our West Side STEM Learning Center or we had facilitators go to schools and did, you know, programming in person. And we realized that a lot of the students that we served didn't have reliable Wi-Fi, did not have access to the device, nor multiple devices. Um, CPS had not kind of given those out to everybody at that point. Um, and we needed to do something because while we're a STEM organization, we're also, in my opinion, more importantly, a community-based organization. So we're there to serve the community um, we're there to serve the communities of our students. So we developed our STEM at home concept, which is where we are building kits completely for students. They are free for students that live in our service areas. Um, they include all the activity materials, all of the supplies, um, directions to follow along. So if students do not have access to device or tech, they're still able to participate and build those STEM skills. But if they do have access to tech, then we offer um, programming virtually. So our facilitators are on Zoom. 
um, or in Google classrooms with our partner schools doing these activities along with the with the kids, which is really exciting. Um, so that worked well. It, I think it it, it solved um, some of the issues, and I you know I think the where we're still trying to focus our efforts here is manpower to build these in a timely fashion and to get them places. Um, we initially started with kit builds in my condo, didn't work. <laughs> So then we moved to <laughs> Natasha's living room and eventually, you know, now we're serving 850 students. So her family was, you gotta, you gotta move these out. Um, we now have a fulfillment center, which is, you know, that takes care of some of that, which is, which is good, but you know, then you funding and making sure we have enough money to buy all these materials and things like that. So, we started these, our first kits went out um, April of last year, I think. And we've been doing them continuously. We have a spring break kit that we are also sending out. Those are for students though, that are living in our service area. Um, so I don't know, I didn't hear where everyone was from here, but it sounds like most people are from Southern Illinois slash Indiana. So that would not technically be in our service area, but you do have a way to get involved with us over spring break. So, so Chicago Public Schools, their spring break is March 29th to April 2nd. And we are hosting a STEM summit where students in grades kindergarten through 12, our student ages that we always serve, K through 12 can participate in different workshops that are being put on by amazing, amazing partners. We have some really, really cool opportunities, especially for high school um, and middle school. So one of the opportunities that's top of mind now, because I'm the most jealous of this one, we are having an animal care specialist come and walk students, high school students through a exhibit at the shed. Amazing. <laughs> Um, we're having students code video games. One of our partners, his name's Fabian. He's a grad student at the University of Chicago. He is doing a week long workshop with high schoolers where they understand the computation behind creating the virus for Corona. So, I mean, and he has taught this to our middle school kids and so really cool, really cool partners. We have cybersecurity on there, engineering. Um, one of our labs at University of Illinois Chicago at UIC, getting students involved with their zebrafish and stem cell research, having them look at microscopes virtually and doing a virtual lab tour. So lots of really cool opportunities that's not limited to students that are in our service area. So teachers, spread the word. We're happy to have your kids join us. Um, any folks on here that are parents, sign up your kids. <laughs> um, you have neighbor kids, invite them. We are open to anybody and everybody participating. And the more the merrier, honestly. So the, I put the link in here and you can see also Holly sharing this. Um, and we have some some different options for your students slash children to join us. So we'd love, well, Sarah, we'd love to have you. Your work is inspiring, and that is so gracious of you to extend the offer to the South Suburban students. Yes, so please. I'm sure there'll be people on this call who will be spreading the word. And also just to be aware of your website and what you're doing, it really is inspiring for us. Um, I know we, you know, we bounce off of each other. Yeah. Everyone comes up with different ideas, but there's not enough, uh, there's never a limit to how many good ideas we can have yep, to get STEM, 100%, 100%. STEM education going. Um, is there anyone that has questions before we move on to our, oh, well, just thank you to both you and Lynn for, for being here today and sharing. Yeah, uh, not a problem. And I put uh, our emails in the chat. So okay. if you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to shoot us an email. We're happy right. to help you help you guys out. Thank you. And um, Holly, I think we should move on to our final item, which is our, we have a little survey. We want to find out, and you're probably like, oh, survey, I don't want to do this. 
it's only a few questions. It'll take you like very little time to do this, but we need to, we want to know what are your needs. Um, so, and also we want to know what you thought about this meeting and we want to find out what kind of format do you like to meet in? Do you want to meet in? If we can meet in person, would you prefer that? Um, is this work better for you? You can have your pajama pants on and talk to us and it's all good. Um, and then what time of day is best for you too? But then the, really the other questions are like, what are your needs? Um, we want to be here to serve you. So we need to know what you need. So that's what that's what the question is all about. So if you can um, click on that, air the, the little link there, the STEM network survey, and fill out that quick survey for us. What, how we can do it right now, if you don't mind. How I will play this cute little video while you're doing it. So while everyone's wrapping up their survey, I just want to, again, thank our speakers. Thank you, Professor Amanda Thompson, for sharing all the exciting things that you're working on and inspiring us to give AR a try. And I also want to say thank you to Sarah and Lynn from Project Exploration and the Chicago STEM Pathways Cooperative for joining us as well. And all of you, all of you educators, um, we hope that this has been helpful to you to have this convening. We'll look forward to convening again in a few months. Um, and of course, I want to thank my team. Thank you, Holly, um, for presenting the slides and making me feel a little bit better about the tech because I usually am not great with that. Tim Mitchell, Tim, thank you for everything you do. Um, Kim is also like, be happy to share any announcements. She does a lot of our social media with us. So um, get it to me, then I'll usually just get it over to Kim and she'll put it up for you. Um, she also works on our pop-up science at home kits and make sure that those get produced. And of course, Amy Eagle. Amy, we love the Roundup. The Roundup is great because it saves you time and it makes STEM fun. And it's just wonderful. But just make sure that you're you're um, you're on that mailing list to get the roundup because it really is a way to brighten your day on a Friday to get the STEM news from Amy. Um, and so thank you to everyone, and thank you, John Soa from our board who's been here too. And um, I know Jeff McLean was here, but he had to run to another meeting. He's our board president. We appreciate all of you, and don't be shy about being in touch. You know how to get a hold of us at Homewood Science Center, edobrez at homewoodsciencecenter.org be happy to, to answer any of your questions. So thanks everyone and have a great evening. Bye.